Welcome back to the audience, both you here today in the room. We have a lot of feedback here. And uh, those of you online. We are now uh, here at the closing session. And um, I hope you have enjoyed all the breakouts. What I have heard was of really high value and a lot of scope was covered. And that's great. So remember, you can find the documentation, all the slides, on the uh, web page of the conference. Um, the idea with this closing session and the two keynotes was uh, to center this around a uh, live demonstration of uh, the state-of-the-art autonomous vehicle uh, of TomTom, Tom, which is one of our partners. Uh, the name of the car is Trillium. I have seen it and it is amazing. Uh, we would have had it here, uh, out there in the yard and uh, do the last uh, presentations there. Unfortunately, due to something called Corona, Trillian couldn't make it for today. So um, instead we have reshaped the uh, closure session. There will still be two keynotes. They will be compressed a little bit uh, where we have uh, Stephanie Leonard from uh, TomTom, who will join us, who has joined us online. And we also have Thomas Bolanda, professor here at DTU. Uh, and both of these will uh, give their uh, addresses. But uh, to uh, compensate for not having Trillian here, uh, instead we can benefit from having a quick recap from all six sessions we have had today, the breakout sessions. And uh, for this, I would now uh, invite the moderators or their uh, substitutes to give a brief uh, three-minute uh, pitch on the outcome of uh, the discussions. And first, I would like to invite my great colleague, Bernadette Bergsma, from the Behavioral Change and Citizen Engagement Workshop. Sorry, breakout. Are you there with us? No, Henrik, I'm here. That's great. Welcome. Bye. Yes, thank you, sorry. So, um, yes, I would like to do a, a quick recap on, on the session regarding behavioral change and citizen engagement. Uh, for the ones that don't know me, I'm uh, Bernadette Weissma and I am the head of communications and stakeholder relations at uh, EAT Urban Mobility. So, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so, what we will what we did actually is um, uh, we invited four experts uh, covering uh, the, uh, from a regulatory perspective, research and business on, um, to, to provide us a view on uh, how they work with citizen engagement and, and behavioral change. And what came out actually is very interesting. So it's, it's actually not so much about um, engaging citizens, but much more about changing behavior. Um, so uh, that's actually the main thing that we want to achieve. So what was presented were four, four different cases and experiences, uh, two of them in living labs, but these living labs were different. So the first living lab uh, presentation was about uh, living labs that uh, are, are um, well, developed for testing technological solutions before they're brought to, to the market. Um, the other living lab was about design-driven living labs. And this means that uh, experiments are done in people's daily lives and uh, interventions are designed uh, that change daily routines and that trigger uh, different behavior. And uh, this, this allows to see whether something works or not. Um, the third presentation was about uh, personalized incentives for car sharing, a project called uh, Share More, which is funded by EAT Urban Mobility. And um, the, the last presentation was about people mobility first. And what is meant by that is that um, we don't need to involve citizens uh, really um, by making them aware that they're involved in certain processes, but it's more about creating the right environment for people so that they automatically might make the right choices by themselves. Um, so uh, this is, th these are four different insights. Um, next slide, please. Uh, however, uh, there, there are quite some uh, overlaps uh, if, we, if we look into that. So, so the conclusions and main takeaways are mostly that uh, there are many ways of involving citizens in changing behavior. 
and there's not one size that fits all. So citizen engagement practices and, and to, to change behavior, we need to adapt uh, each and every single uh, application to specific project or situation. We have to adapt to local contexts. And um, all experts also agree that uh, the human needs should be taken into account first before looking for solutions. So we first need to get an understanding of what people actually need and what they want and what the barriers are for people to change their behavior. Um, another thing that came back in all of them is that, that uh, real life environments are key to test and experiment, uh, such as living lab, but it could also just be in uh, parts of the city or neighborhoods. And uh, another thing very important is cooperation. So um, cities should lead at first, at least, uh, as a facilitator and bring together the relevant stakeholders. So because cities cannot do it alone, obviously. So uh, involvement of businesses, universities, research and citizens, the end user are really needed. But citizens are, uh, should, or cities should be in the lead at the beginning. And at the end, uh, a conclusion is that we are still learning. So we have to, to learn by doing by exchanging experiences and insights like we have done today. And we should just uh, keep on testing and experimenting within our cities and with uh, our citizens. So that was it uh, from my part. Back uh, to you, Henrik. Thank you so much. You probably can't hear me, but thank you, Bernadette. Uh, and I give the floor to Otto to uh, first uh, give a report from the long distance cycling workshop and then the link between transport and infrastructure and urban planning. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm reporting first from the long distance uh, cycling workshop. As, as you can see here, there was a lot of uh, different uh, lectures in this workshop. And I will try just to take the main uh, takeaways from that uh, workshop. So. Um, the first presentation by Rampel looked at, um, uh, she, she's representative from the Bicycle Ambassador Network. And uh, some of the takeaway are that the uh, COVID is actually some kind of opportunity for bicycling um, because um, people don't like to take public transport. So uh, there's a cycling boom around cities um, and especially for those cities who uh, before didn't prioritize bicycling, they got an opportunity actually now uh, for promoting bicycling. Um, then um, some of the lessons I wrote down from that lecture was that you need to get more bicyclists, you need a protected bicycling network, you need that to be coherent, direct and safe. Um, and also that you could have landmarks that uh, could market uh, the network. So like a uh, nice bridges or architectural landmarks because then people are becoming aware of, of uh, these bicycle network. Then also in general that bicycle uh, parking related to public transport is an important point of view because that could um, add distance to trips but also pi parking in general. Then it was also I think a funny note that a uh, number of women drivers could be an indicator on how safe the paths are because in cities where you have a safe network, like in Copenhagen or Amsterdam, the um, gender share is almost equal, whereas you have other cities where there are very few women who use uh, bicycling, and that could be an indicator on the, um, on, on the quality of the network. Then the next presentation was from the cycle superhighways, um, um, and the conclusions were that there are potential for longer trips uh, which could be like both for sport, more sporting purposes, but also people starting to use e-bikes. Um, a general conclusion was that to promote that, people need to uh, be able to change at work. So that's not, it's not only enough to build the, the physical infrastructure, but also look at what is a facility at the workplace. Um, again, these are exactly the same points as the first lecture, so that the network needs to be coherent, direct, and safe. Um, but actually, when... Uh, you have such a network and there are a few of these super bicycle uh, highways in Copenhagen. They can actually compete with the S train. So they cover trips with the same average trip length. Um, and when you build these networks, there have been a quite large increase in, um, in use of bicycling as compared to before, um, both on the past, but then also some of them actually came from prior car use. Then a point mentioned was also that there, there are lack of data, so the lack of proper digital networks for bicycling. 
um, there's a lack of, um, you need better modeling and decision support than there's uh, lacking data. The next, next presentation was uh, Jeppe Rick from DTU. Um, and here they actually analyzed these bicycle networks in Copenhagen. There was another report from incentives and now there are new studies uh, that, that he did uh, in a more um, comprehensive way. And generally it shows that this bicycle network had actually a very high um, internal rate of return of 11%. That is much higher than other projects in Denmark. So typically it's very difficult for public transport investments to have 4%, which is the government threshold, but also road projects typically lays between four and, and six or 7%. So it seems that it's very uh, good investments. Um, and even then, if you have the new health benefits, you have even higher uh, rate of returns. Then going to the next uh, part of the presentation, it was uh, several uh, lectures about the Bike Longer project, which is an EET, Urban Mobility Project. Some of the general findings here are actually quite the same as the lectures before. So that e-bikes extend driving ranges and you need these coherent direct paths that you need data for on bicycle infrastructure. And in this project, it is done by merging different existing data sources. You also need better decision support to cities um, and to know what is the demand and preferences of bicyclists. Then in this project, uh, there's a made an app-based solution that are combined with smart devices such as bicycle helmets or cycle lamps that could create massive data. Then there were two uh, presentations from DTU and from Tel Aviv, and um, they have done a um, stakeholder interview and also user interviews in the two cities of uh, Copenhagen and Tel Aviv. And uh, I think many of the points that came out are interesting. So they talked about barriers and fa facilitators using bicycling. And uh, there's a number of factors that could influence why people are not using bicycle and how they could use bicycle that um, I have written here. So um, car traffic pollution, thefts are, are like on the barrier side, also safety um, and also uh, facilities at the de destination. Both mentioned infrastructure, but actually in Tel Aviv, it was mentioned more than in Copenhagen and probably because the existing infrastructure is uh, of less quality in, um, in Tel Aviv than in Copenhagen. It's interesting actually that the similarities among the user interviews, they were quite uh, the same. So there's quite similarity, even that the contexts are so different in Tel Aviv and Copenhagen, the users have actually the same, more or less the same preferences. I think that is interesting regarding transferability of, of the findings. On the other hand, there was actually quite some differences between what the user said and what the stakeholder said. There was also similarities, but I noted also there was quite some differences. That is meaning that the stakeholders, they do something for planning what they believe that the users prefer, but the users actually prefer something else or they have preferences, something else. So I think that sort of difference is quite interesting, right? Because um, if the stakeholders build or invest after what they believe users prefer, but the users prefer something different, then um, you are not using the investments optimal. Then uh, the, there was a, the last presentation was by um, Technion looking at this app that you could collect data. And the whole idea is that it's very, very, very ex expensive to collect data. So if you could use a crowdsourcing paradigm where you get data from bicyclists or users, then you could get data in a much smarter way. And as we also saw before, several of the organization actually miss uh, data on bicyclists. And that could be by notching through different services like fitness, navigation, or community. Um, and then you have Maybe you could also collect data interactively uh, so the bicyclists could report problems in the network. And that is a way that you can, that municipalities can, can get data on the infrastructure because it's a problem that we don't have good data on, on the bicycle uh, infrastructure. Just finally, we could just say that this project is not continued uh, because otherwise we would have made full-time tests of this app in uh, five different cities, um, but now, We'll try to continue your work from other funding in, um, in uh, Israel and in, in Denmark. Yes? 
Then I will continue to report on the afternoon session that I was uh, chairing. And, and this whole session was about the link between transport infrastructure and, and urban planning with several uh, lectures that um, uh, touch upon the same topic. Um, and just going to the takeaway, I think that the first presentation by, or the presentation by Helge Hilnhotter said or showed that actually more than half of the time in public transport is used on walking or waiting, um, not within the vehicles. And actually that is then perceived as 70% of the time by the passengers. However, most of the focus when you invest in public transport is actually to improve the services themselves. Um, but that could be gained by looking at access and egress and also transferring and waiting time in the public transport. Also, uh, there was a mention that 80% of the impression of a person is what you see or what is the surroundings. So actually, if you can improve the sur surroundings uh, when you walk um, in the city or to and from the station, it influences how time is perceived. So if the walk is nice, people are, are willing to walk longer than if the, the, the walk is not nice. Um, also that you could use uh, paths in the catchment area to promote active modes. Um, you could also change, for example, the stations or the surroundings uh, so that you could shop along the way. So you could have multi-purpose uh, journeys in, in a way to uh, promote public transport. Then uh, there were several uh, lectures about that if you have a joint land development plan and public transport development, that would secure funding for the public transport and that would also enable uh, sustainable urban development. I mean, that is mainly for new uh, part of the cities, but it could also be when you rebuild existing part of the cities. Then there was a discussion about uh, transport oriented, transit oriented urban development. Uh, especially in the suburban context, that is to some extent people focus most on the city centers, but there's actually a lot to gain in the suburbs in uh, improving the stations and their so surrounding and also improving the, the wayfinding to and from the stations and how people perceive safety in the, in the public transport. And then finally, at the end of the session, we had um, a presentation looking more on quantitative evidence on rail factor and urban environment. And I think that um, lecture actually confirmed many of the points that were given in the, um, in the prior presentation. So on rail effect, network effects, and uh, effects of uh, dense urban structures. Much, Otto. Uh, can I please ask Michael Nybacher from KTH to present the electromobility session? Yes, I'm here. Hope you can hear me. We hear you. Good. Yes, so we had a session called Electromobility towards 100% electrification, where we had five interesting talks. Uh, two from DTU talking about vehicle grid integration and vehicle to grid. Um, then we had uh, two talks, uh, one from KTH talking about electric road system and uh, dynamic road charging, uh, as well as one from Electrion, a startup uh, company uh, doing exactly that, uh, building electric roads, uh, charging while driving. And then we finally had a, a presentation from TomTom, Tom, uh, Robin van der Berg, looking more on an EV driver's perspective. So what I tried to do is to take out some key takeaway uh, from the presentations uh, taken out of their context. So bear with me on that and apologize to the presenters if something is wrong. Um, so if we start with the first, uh, it was clear that we need to push for smarter chargers. Uh, it will give us both uh, in terms of the users um, owning the vehicles and uh, having the chargers in their home as well as uh, societal benefits with this uh, vehicle grid interaction. So it's not enough just to uh, plug in your car, but you, you need to have a charger that can balance uh, in terms of the, the grid impact. We also saw through one of the talk uh, that the capacity loss on the vehicle battery and during this vehicle grid interaction, um, charging and discharging is only 1% per year or 72 euro per year 
in the uh, studies that they have made with that type of a vehicle and that size of a, of a battery. So having a big, bigger battery means less impact on the lifetime of the battery. And this cycling is actually not the, the biggest part. It's the regular aging of batteries that is the most uh, part of the aging of the battery. So still a good case in terms of looking at the, the bigger picture and the complete uh, revenue back to the user by having your vehicle connected to the grid in order to balance the grid. Um, we also um, got some takeaway from the electric road system dynamic charging. So by utilizing um, transport data and optimizing uh, the placement of these electric roads sections, um, you can electrify 3.25 times more transportation work, or you can cut infrastructure cost by 80% rather than just electrifying a long stretch of road. So keeping in mind that using a lot of data and optimization, you can reach a much more overall uh, effective solution at the end. Uh, likewise, uh, we also heard that uh, only a combined solution of dynamic electric roads or dynamic charging uh, in cities and intercities road uh, will be able to provide us 100% electrification. Specifically looking at the uh, heavy uh, trucks and heavy transportation tasks that will otherwise uh, demand a huge amount of uh, battery carrying uh, to do its transportation task. Um, and we also heard that towards 100% is still far ahead, just looking at the current EV sales of 5% of the total fleet. So in terms of that, we still have a long way to go. And one way uh, to help out is to help the users in a better user experience by integrating rather than having fragmented solution and high tech features that is hard for the users to understand. So there, the, the main takeaway is to open up uh, the data and integrate in order to accelerate adoption of EVs. So to conclude, uh, integration seems to be an important aspect here and comes back in many different parts of the discussion in order for us to create a truly sustainable solution. And this is also what uh, EIT Urban Mobility can help provide with the uh, funding initiatives uh, we have in that, as well as the education and uh, startup support. So we need to integrate uh, to the grid. We need to integrate uh, transport and EV data uh, for optimization and easier uh, user experience. So that was the main summation and takeaways from my session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail from Stockholm. Uh, over to Claudio calling from Helsinki. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. So a uh, very brief report on the session that we had on uh, intelligent transport system today. Uh, um, we had four speakers uh, from uh, different type of institutions. So from, from industry, from uh, uh, cities and then national authorities and then universities. And we touched different topics about how to uh, develop further intelligent uh, transport system, or at least to make them more intelligent. Intelligent. So the topics uh, we touched, uh, just a few um, words on takeaways from our session. So one was about micromobility. Uh, that seems to be um, a phenomenon that wrapped up even more now with these, um, uh, in this last, uh, last year. And then, uh, so there are, of course, uh, brings opportunities, possibilities, but it also has a few issues that need to be uh, dealt with fairness of, of, of this mode, inclusiveness, and studied uh, what kind of model shift uh, can actually um, happen to that. So if it is more uh, towards uh, taking more users out of private cars or public transport or taxis and, and, and all these kind of different services. Uh, we have seen that there is a lot of data available and a lot of ways of, of um, processing this data. And um, we also saw a quite important point is that um, 
some parts that may look, um, some operational mode of the system may look quite technical, actually have very strong implication on um, on then how this uh, is, is affecting actually the mobility of different people. For example, repositioning uh, algorithms that are at the end uh, out there, I mean, if they are left completely to, uh, to companies, they will just go towards higher demand. Uh, whereas, uh, for example, cities can, encor can encourage uh, this kind of algorithms to work and promote um, a fair balance in the sense of making these services available uh, throughout the whole city. And, and this is something that has been uh, pushed more in some, in some areas than, than others. Um, then we went into the topic of automation. Uh, we, we saw that um, despite some um, very optimistic vision by, by, by some companies, it's still far from the future seeing this, this automation really happening. So we, we are going to get, uh, be able to use fully automated, let's say services probably in 20 years, maybe more. Uh, and um, not surprisingly, this technology is still um, lagging behind. And in particular uh, for the, for of course, dealing with the different um, not so expected, uh, let's say circumstances that are, um, that are happening in, in different places. And, and uh, we have seen, for example, uh, pilots are starting in, in um, very advanced pilots are starting in places like in Arizona, where, uh, where it's sunny, they all here, never uh, raining, never snowing. And, but a lot of other issues are, have to be dealt in order to, to see this kind of system in Nordic countries. Uh, but it's very good to start getting prepared um, to these kind of services. And um, so, and this, um, both in terms of, of course, uh, technology, but also in terms of user acceptance of, of how how our um, cities, for example, authorities can actually uh, handle those. And in this, um, I connect to the other speaker that was talking about uh, mobility labs. Uh, and, and here uh, it's of course, uh, we saw it as a great way with a lot of examples for cities, uh, how they can actually promote and enable uh, future smart mobility. And we have seen it in Helsinki, a lot of activities uh, taking place in this uh, respect with a lot of activities and then trying to promote citizen engagement uh, in, all, in, in designing future mobility and how they actually would prefer uh, this to look like and then enabling that. And uh, the last uh, topic, let's say that we touch was about open data. Uh, we started from a pilot uh, that is uh, running actually here in Helsinki about open traffic data and then we went uh, into um, discussing more and more on, on this, this level of data and also ownership of data and then what, what kind of also uh, private services can, can, can or should provide uh, so that we enable um, smart mobility, more intelligent uh, mobility. And of course, in this discussion, we, we, uh, we identified the two main uh, drivers uh, that, that should be always uh, kept in mind, which is of course, one is technologi technological development and second is of course policy. So they need to go in a certain sense, um, even though they're very uh, different to some extent, but in a very important sense, hand in hand. So, um, and then they are of course very much interrelated, even though the, the relation is not uh, very visible. Um, yeah, and that's it for my session. I hope I was uh, brief enough. And yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for this. Thank you very much, Claudio, for it. And uh, now, finally, we have Kerstin Heinecke, I hope, online uh, from McKinsey and um, reporting from Transport in the Time of Pandemics. Thank you so much um, for doing this. So uh, Kerstin Heinecke, partner with McKinsey, lead our Center for Future Mobility, our think tank on the mobility disruption in Europe. Uh, thanks for having me. I think we had an awesome session on uh, transport in the time of the pandemic. We um, started with uh, Niklas Petersen talking about what he about the work that he has been doing on neural network models and and how to use them to support social distancing requirements in public transit. Um, and I think we we found out or we heard that that this is actually a great tool how to make sure that we can do social distancing in public transit by taking a look how people move from A to B, taking a look at uh, travel patterns and, and modeling travel patterns and therefore then enabling social distancing. 
We then listened to uh, Anna Novak, who's a software engineer at TomTom, and she led us through a great uh, summary of the data that TomTom has, the uh, TomTom traffic and, and travel information or the TomTom traffic index, looking at how um, uh, the pandemic has um, uh, actually in, uh, influenced mobility and has influenced traffic patterns. One of the quotes she used was that the world stopped driving um, and these congestion levels that they, that they are looking at over TomTom -tom have been on a significantly lower level and also on a consistently lower level vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the pre-COVID level. And this hasn't changed yet. And then we had a bit of a discussion sort of, will this be the end of traditional working hours and will traffic and congestion change forever? But in the end, we came to the conclusion or Anna came to the conclusion that it's too early to tell simply because uh, traffic is still down pretty much, but we don't know if and when it may bounce back. And then um, in, the final, in the final slot we had, uh, we listened to Eric Yenelius, who's an associate professor at KTH and the head of division of transport planning. And he was talking about an analysis he did looking at public transit um, in, in Stockholm and taking a look at how this actually changed during COVID. And he says, yes, there is a reduction. It's driven by fewer travelers in the system, much more so than by a reduction of trips of those who actually still travel. And then he, he went a bit into differences across geographies um, and also across demography. And in the end, there is a difference there with the impoverished areas actually being the most likely to stop traveling, uh, sorry, the least likely, apologies, the least likely to stop traveling and the most likely to continue to use their public transit uh, passes and, and, and keep, keep mobile. Um, we, we also, so I also got the opportunity to pre uh, present a bit McKinsey's view of the world on this. Um, what, what, what we found in McKinsey is we're saying, we do believe that COVID is actually accelerating the transition towards a, a more sustainable mobility landscape that's also more sustainable by being much less car centric, uh, also by being more, um, uh, more electrified. But uh, in, in essence, we do believe that uh, in order to move to a more sustainable mobility, especially in urban areas, we need not only to switch to electrification of vehicles, but we also need to switch away from individual personal mobility and into some other forms of transport. We discussed a couple. But in the end, what we will need and what we see as the strongest driver is more restrictive urban regulations with cities actually daring to do uh, unpopular things. I think uh, it has shown and has been shown in many cities. And I think Paris is a great example here that this, while seemingly unpopular, actually isn't necessarily as unpopular as we believe. So therefore, I think we're going to see much more of this regulation going forward. Thanks again to the speakers. I think it was an awesome session and thanks to all of you for having us here. Thank you. Thank you, Kasten. Thank you all. And uh, thank you to the audience also for being patient. I think we will run over, but...